Smart piccoloists and dapper drummers, drain your spit valves, secure your snare heads, and 76 trombones led the big parade with 110 cornets close at hand. Because it's time to Shapoopy. Do you not know Music Man? That's a song in Music Man. I know it's a song. Oh, okay. Man. Shapoopy, Shapoopy, Shapoopy. The girl who's hard to get. Welcome back. I am Omen Sade. And I am Nick McGill. Together, we are Feckless Moes. And this is Talk Tall to Me. A half-tempo glide step before the gazebo of prog rock, in which note-for-note note Nick and oral command Omen will await with glee the coming of the Wells Fargo wagon, delivering to us every single track that sadder but wiser rock band Jethro Tull has ever produced. We will pick a little and talk a little about the handsome stranger Martin Barr who has come to town. We will listen in rapt attention to David Pegg as he tells us, You got trouble right here in River City with a capital T, and that rhymes with P, and that stands for pool. Blackpool, that is. With a capital P... That stands for T, and that's that. No, with a capital P that I, rhymes I'm with still, T, and that stands for tall. I'm still doing my thing, Nick. I'm still doing my <laughs> I'm thing. I'm so sorry. And we will discover that while a flautist will kiss on the very first date is usually a hussy, and a flautist will kiss on the second time out is anything but fussy, a flautist will wait till the third time round, head in the clouds, feet on the ground. She's the one you're glad you found. She's Ian Anderson. <laughs> Nick, welcome back. Goodness me, that was... I mean, we got to do everything musical-based from now on, apparently. It is a, a plethora of of fodder to pull from. I got really excited because I was reading in this month's issue of Vogue magazine the interview with the woman who's going to be playing in the new Broadway revival of Funny Girl. And okay. it's, it got me really excited about the Golden Age musicals. Yeah, that is that is exciting, yeah. Welcome back, Nick, and welcome to our episode. We have the pleasure of talking about yet another Jethro Tull song on this episode. S- surprise, everyone. Hate to, hate to spoil the surprise for you so soon, but yet another Jethro Tull. It's the final Jethro Tull song off of side A of Broadsword. That's exciting. It really is. This is the last. <laughs> it really in... is the last song. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the final of the beastie side of things. Yes, correct. Very good. The final off of the beastie side. Yeah. Well, without further ado, Nick, shall we jump into that song also? What is that song? Well, let's. I just want to throw out a single sentence worth of, of trivia about this album. Okay. I'm this ready. is former Genesis guitarist Steve Hackett's favorite album, or one of his favorite albums, is Broadsword. Ever? Or Jethro Tull albums? It just says one of his favorite albums. So let's say ever. His favorite album ever. One of, confirmed. one, one of, one of. I don't want to put, I don't want to put words into former Genesis guitarist Steve Hackett's mouth. <laughs> Not without a shoehorn. Not without consent. That's right. Well, that's very exciting. A man of good taste, clearly. Absolutely. So this week, we are going to talk slow marching band. There it is. There it is. So why don't we listen to slow marching band? And then talk about it. Hey, I have an idea. Okay. Let's do that thing you just said. Hey, that's a pretty good idea. Let's have a listen. Nick McGill. Wow. Ian. Ian Anderson, ladies and gentlemen. That actually, actually, I'm Omen Thomas Sade. Oh. I'm sorry oh, I, I, to disappoint. I thought we had a that we had a, an interview with Ian Anderson here. Someday. That's embarrassing. Nick, can I ask you, after listening to that song, or indeed while listening to that song, what would you describe your emotional state as? I would say like Thirty percent confused. Uh, let's go with forty percent 
melancholic. Okay, yeah. And let's put that last 30% as as nostalgic. Ooh. Yeah, okay, cool. What about you? I I would say that I feel overwhelmed with with bittersweet longing. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you were to break down overwhelmed by bittersweet longing into its composite parts, that would be That's exactly what I, I described. Into the elements thereof, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was describing the chemical I was describing the chemical molecule you were describing the atoms of which it was composed. Precisely, yep. Yeah. So, this is actually one of the songs on the album that whenever it comes on, I do kind of have to stop what I'm doing and really melt into it. It is a meltable song. It is one that up until this point in the album, it it's it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. In not in not in a bad way at all. It just doesn't feel like any of the other songs that we've had thus far. I mean, sonically a little bit, but the just the the personal feel to it, the lamenting feel to it. Mm-hmm. You know, it feels a lot more than kind of just like the negative bad news that we've been listening to the last couple songs. Well, and the pace is different as well. I mean, oh, very look much. at the previous songs. Let's look at them. What are they? Beastie Clasp, Fall Down on Hard Times, and Flying Colors. Right. So they're all quite up-tempo in comparison. Exactly. Yeah. Slow Marching Band is slow in terms of the tempo. It is slow in marching. Yeah. And it's a band. But I think it's I think it's a terrific way to end the side this side of the album. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. It's a it's a perfect button for a single side. You again you lose you do lose some of that effect when you're listening to a CD, when you're listening mm. to MP3s, you know, when you're mm. listening to Jethro Tull on shuffle and it shows up after Aqualung, you know, you don't get that. You don't get to experience the sculpt of the sound. But e- even without any of that, taken on its own, like, it's a very effective song. Oh, goodness, yes. I I associate this song a little bit with a couple of others and Further On. Okay. And also Requiem. Okay, I like it. Those work. I find that there's a similar feeling, and and I can remember when I was a teenager or a young adult and and having the big sad... I would I would often listen to those three songs. I'd make a little sad list. They speak to that emotion. Yes. And yeah, they they really there's something I don't want to say cathartic about it, but it certainly it certainly justifies your feelings in a way, you know? Yes, and I think that they they've shown that that listening to music that makes you sad actually makes you feel better about being sad. Yeah, it's like a shoulder to cry on almost. It is. Yeah. It is. It's like, oh, there is I'm not alone in my sadness. Exactly. And sadness can be so beautiful. Yeah. Beautifully expressed at least. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Speaking of the expression of it, shall we talk about the music? Let us musically express ourselves. Toot toot. Right. <laughs> right off the bat, there is the sound is so beautifully clean. Yeah. The very beginning is that guitar, acoustic guitar and flute. The mandolin is also involved in there in the first yeah. couple of measures. Piano as well. Piano comes in very quickly. Yep. That's true. But right off the bat, it's just the flute and the guitar. And I think that's probably Ian squared. Oh, interesting. Ian playing both instruments, not at the same time. Because it's acoustic. Yeah, you're right. And it has his kind of signature flavor. Yeah, there was, I want to go back to, I don't think it was last episode. I think it was two episodes ago. I talked about how someone posted in our Discord that there was a video interview with Martin with a guitar just kind of noodling. Oh, yes. It further... I completely forgot about it until now. In the very beginning, he sits down with his acoustic and he's like, I really don't know how to play this. Like, I'm strictly an electric guy. So that really, oh, like, hammers home our theories that 
probably any time we hear acoustic guitar, it's going to be Ian. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Yeah. Cool. Cool find. So, so yeah, I think I think you're right. It probably is Ian squared there with Martin on the Mando. Possibly is is Very Martin possibly. credited for for Mando? I forget who has that. I think David Pegg does play the mandolin a little bit. It is Peggy on the album. Yeah. Oh, although Martin does have acoustic credit on here, so it could be either Ian and Martin both have acoustic credit on the album as a whole. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm gonna bet that it's Ian. It feels laconic enough to be Ian here. I think it, it for Martin, it would be more like Jeffrey playing the bass, you know, possibly just a little more like, yeah, I'm playing because this is how I play. <laughs> yes, there's a sensitivity and a facility with this instrument that leads me to believe that it is the more expert of the acoustic guitar players. Correct. And then the piano builds up with that incredible chord that is that releases the song into being the chord that is played by Peter John Batiste. Yeah. Then Ian starts singing right there. Would you join a slow marching band? Something interesting about the piano, especially in those first couple of verses, there is a little bit of fluidity to the tempo of the piano. Oh. He kind of ebbs and flows the time signature. You know, he slows down that dun 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 dun, bon, da, da, yeah, da, 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 da. interesting. Okay, and then I think once we get the drums coming in. A little later on, kind of after that first verse. Take a hand and take a bow. The tempo regulates a little bit, but it's still, the whole song has that feeling of that kind of elasticity of time. Yeah, yeah, there's a, a sweeping that it really adds to the effect of of how how kind of epic and, and broad it is by having that kind of fluctuate a little bit. Yes, and I think that relates very much to the lyrics and the theme of the song that we'll talk about later. Sure, very nice, okay. So yeah, it it plunges, it kind of crescendos up and everybody kind of builds in and it just bursts with this lamenting, gorgeous, epic sound with everybody coming in. I see a great big open sky on a horizon here. I see standing on a hillside just singing singing echoes into the, the the mountains and speaking of the singing ian is an incredibly good voice here i i it's think this good. is maybe the best that he has sounded as a singer it's very very good yeah he really is like open and and fluid and supported and it just sounds fantastic yeah there was i think it was this album it might it might have might have been beastie even i'm not sure there was one not too long ago that we were like ian is really at his prime right there he was kind of hitting the top of his range like knocking up against it yeah yeah it was st- it still sounded good but this right. one he's very comfortably like in his middle range it, j- it just works really well yeah another thing that just occurred to me about this album you know obviously it has inspired the formation of other groups you know but i think it's interesting how the Broadsword Boys didn't enjoy as much popularity <laughs> as the Beastie Boys. Oh, interesting. Good theory. Good theory, yeah. The bro- the broads the broadsword broads. Yeah. yeah it's like yeah. they were they were a side two group. There you go, yeah. But anyway, when the drums come in after the I don't know, do they come in right at the chorus? I think Yes, they do, I think. Is it right at, is it right there? It's not too long into the singing. I think because I I remember hearing a a cymbal. I think that, you know what? I think cymbals come in right before the chorus with its. Okay. Did you get behind a slow marching band? And And then the toms, those toms leading into the snares. So we go. Yeah. There's that. Yeah. There's that. It's it's so it's like full. 80s glamtasm. Yes, yes. And it's so fun. Take a hand and take a bow. And then he works in a good a good marching snare on very regularly when he says marching band. In particular, I noticed it marking time through winter. Yeah. Marking time and then march the band. Yep. 
Oh, cool, cool. Still marking time through winter. Just the swell when we hit the chorus of all the instruments coming together and the voice, it, it is it produces this incredible swell of emotion that is really hard to not get swept away by. I, I just I'm a I think I'm a big fan of this song, is what I'm realizing. I think you are too. You know, I th- I would be by golly, would I love to hear Dee's orchestration behind this? Yes. That would hammer at home. I would probably weep at this song if this had D strings in it. There's something, though, that I think is really effective about the way that Peter John Batiste is playing the piano. Yeah. Whereas, for instance, with John Evan, mm-hmm. there was a sense, and this is what we love about John Evan, there was a sense of indulgence with him playing the yeah. piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And similarly, but in a very different way with special guest Eddie Jobson, there was that sense of, you feel the player through the music. You know what I mean? There's that There's that sense of the personality coming through very strong. yeah. With PJV, it's it's as if he has completely subsumed himself in the piano just for exactly what the song needs. There's there's something clean about it that I feel allows me to have the emotion rather than me hearing, oh, yes, that's the emotion yeah. of the player. I think it works that John Evan was like was there and he was embodying the music. He was putting his personality through it and it was amazing. It's brilliant, brilliant keyboarding. Yes. Whereas PJV and is, is like, is a consummate professional. He's like, I am here to play the keyboards and I'm going to knock the snot out of them, but I'm going to let, I'm going to let them work with the rest of the music, you know? And I think that honestly works really well kind of to describe early tall versus Versus 80s tall. That's exactly what I was going to say. You know, I think it's a very different thing being the pianist who is with the band for the years when they are on the rise and and achieving all this incredible success after success. It's very different to be the pianist who jo- the, who's 10 years younger than everybody else Yeah, and joins the band once they are already, you know, maybe at their nadir. They're already so well established. So I think, I think that there is a, an element of perhaps feeling like, oh, well, you know, I have to just like play super professionally, like you said. Right, right, yeah. And certainly it being his first go with the band, you know, you 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 got to stick in line during your trial period, you know? You know, you don't want to, you don't want to step too far out of line. A stick in line saves nine. That's, yeah, that's my favorite tell song, yeah. You know what is a little bit not super present for, in this song? The electric guitar? Ooh. I was going to say the bass. Oh, I heard it like once or twice. It got mm-hmm. a little funky, I think about halfway through, but I only heard it a couple of times and then it fell away. Still, still. It's pulled a lot further back. I think that I think that the piano is really providing a lot of the bass notes for this song. Sure. Yeah. So even if the bass is actually being played, we're kind, it's kind of getting doubled up with the piano. And so we hear the 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 piano more. Yeah. The electric guitar, we do hear more later in the song than in the first part. Yeah. Martin has some great riffs. There's one in particular that I really like where, where it goes, did it, 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 you played for me. And it seems like he's playing, rather than playing one note at a time, he's always playing two notes in harmony with each other, that entire riff. Cool. Okay. And it's so cool. It's just yeah, yeah. so neat. Oh, you played for me. And then there's no pageantry leading up to the ending of this song. It really is for a slow song, it's a quick button. It's still like a slow like kind of fade out, but it's I I'm never prepared for the ending of this song. I feel like it can go on for another three minutes. That's a very interesting way of putting it. And I think we should talk more about that feeling later. (laughs) Okay. After the episode. Oh, oh, that, okay. It's lovely. It it doesn't fade out into oblivion. There is a a, a button. Yep. Ian, I think, buttons it with a little harmonic note on the acoustic guitar. Mm. And it's so delightful and and heartrending. It's really lovely. I, I, I really enjoyed everything about this song musically. It's fairly rare that we get a song of this caliber anymore, of like a really, really sweet, sweeping, maybe melancholic sound, that when we do get them, they're so, 
they're so beautifully orchestrated and, and just like pieced together. Not that the other ones aren't. Right. But there's it, there, it's just so effective that they, they place them so sparingly and strategically. Yes. Well, we're moving into or we're moving towards at least Tull's quote unquote heavy rock era. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Take that, Metallica. And so when we have these more acoustic, more emotionally raw songs, they, they it is like, <gasps> oh, yeah, no, I was not expecting this. I wasn't prepared. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Great. Yeah. It's really great. Yeah. Nick, anything else to say musically about this song? That's it for me. Well, sounds like we should take a little break. We're about halfway there. Nick, do you have anything, do you have any correspondence or any um, any business to take care of during this break? I have nothing. We have we have tidied up the inbox and the outbox and the cat box. Wow, thank goodness. Well, <laughs> would you uh care for a cup of tea? Sure. I I'm a I'm a big rooibos fan. I've I've got a I've got a peach rooibos that I'm really big into. I've got a, I found a chocolate rooibos that Numi does. It's very, very good. I don't drink coffee anymore, even. I'm just drinking the tea. Yeah. Wow. That's that's very earthy. That's earthy. Yeah. What is that? Is that a green? It's something that, that Mary's been making me drink. It's uh, it's actually water from a puddle that is outside. Oh. And that's... It's for your vitamins! Thank you. Yes, I know. Wow. So it's probably... There probably is green in there. It's green. Yeah, yeah, there's green. Okay, but it's not green tea. Okay. Do you want to get back to the episode? <sighs> yeah, probably before I throw up. Let's do Let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. All right. Welcome back, Nick. Here we are in the second half. Here we are. We have flipped the vinyl. We are on to the second half of the song. Let's talk about... The lyrics, the content. Let's do that. What is this song about, Nick? <laughs> Let's go back to your thirty percent confusion. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's kind of that's that's exactly what the confusion stems from. And I've got a couple of theories, and I've I've also got something that I think was posited by the author of the article in one of the Tull magazines that I have. Oh, interesting. One of them. Because I, I, I'm fairly confident it was not it was not a quote from Ian. Right. On the surface, to me, this sounds like a breakup song, right? Mm. Yeah. However, either it's a breakup song couched in the guise of like leaving the band. Right. Or I'm listening. It's actually a song about Barrymore Barlow in the guise of a breakup song. That's really interesting. Yeah, I I think any and all of those theories are valid. I I feel like my heart knows what this song is about. But you can't put it to words. But my brain and my face are, are challenged to, in more ways than one. <laughs> But in, in terms of explaining it. So to give the barest amount of credit, because I can't tell you who the writer was or even which magazine it came from, the idea that this song is about Barry was not my idea. That's the that's the one from the magazine, from the tall magazine that I was reading. So, Wait, when you say Barrymore Barlow, do you mean John Glasscock? No, Barrymore Barlow saying, oh, interesting. Hey, hey, goodbye, you're out of the band. Oh, interesting. But didn't, didn't Barrymore leave the band because he didn't want to be in it anymore? I mean, it was part of the big schism. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was the one who was so upset. He was particularly touched and affected by by Glasscock's death. Yeah. Yeah, but wasn't he kind of a partier too? Or was that... That was Glenn. That was Glenn Cornick. I think that it could be about any one of the previous members of the band, or it could be about the general sense of having reached the end of a relationship with any and or all of them, or it is just thematically about that kind of leaving moment anyway. That's exactly what I was just thinking. The fact that Jethro Tull 
in parentheses, Ian Anderson has reached this point, this, this self-awareness and this acknowledgement of, well, I'm Jeffro Tall, so these guys could be going at any moment. You know, not not saying like I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of them left and right, but like there's a sense of as long as I, Ian Anderson, am slow marching, Jeff Grotal is is alive, is is a thing, is an entity. Well, and that's interesting because if you look at the lyrics, the the way that it's phrased, the grammar of it is would you join a slow marching band? Could you get behind a slow marching band? Yeah. Implying you're with me now, yeah. but are you about to walk away? It's almost a, a meditation on the impermanence of relationships in general. I, I also yeah. think that, you know, maybe the way that the music feels is is sort of this, this swirl of different things. And I almost wonder if it's, you know, all of the feelings from that, all the feelings about the point in his life that he is, all of his fears about his relationships all coming together in this one expression and that it's not any single thing. You can't identify any one of those things. It's, it, it is just an expression of, of all of that kind of quintessence. Yeah, it's it's kind of, it's a quilt of everything that makes you feel that way. This show brought to you by the word quilt. <laughs> quilt. When you're cold, put on a quilt. <laughs> <laughs> there are two things that I want to say. One yeah. of them is relating this to another, yet another tall song, and the other is a silly joke or a silly anecdote. Go on. This reminds me, this kind of feels like the flip side, the question to which the answer is. It's from dot com. dot com. It's Wicked Windows. Is that what it's called? Yes, yeah. Wicked Windows. Yeah. <laughs> this this reminds me of the the flip side of Wicked Windows, where it's like this is all of the fears and perhaps frustrations and melancholy and the other one, the other feelings about you know the fact that people leave your life sometimes. Okay. And Wicked Windows feels like. Oh my gosh, I can't believe all these people have stuck by me all this time. Wow, I am lucky. Huh. Interesting. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be about Jethro Tull. Not everything has to be about <laughs> Jethro Tull, Nick. At least for an hour it is every Tuesday. <laughs> but that that's not true at all. We go on some serious tangents. But it's 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 really like Ian is the slow marching band. Yes, he's the fixed point. He is inviting people in to join the band. He is the that fixed point and everybody else orbits around him. And some some may leave. Some take may take pleasure in their leaving whatever right. life they had and and join him. And then others others will take a hand and take a bow. You played for me, that's all for now. Eddie Jobson. Eddie Jobson. Sure. D. Palmer. Not D. Snyder. I love, uh, and never mind the words, just hum along and keep on going. Oh, never mind the words, just hum along and keep on going. I think that that's, uh, it's, it, it is amazing. It does, it does give me the impression of like, it's almost like a ship. It's like, you know, you go to port, you take on crew. Don't worry how it works. We'll just figure it out, you know? Yeah. I really like the hum along. I really love that line because it's, to me, it's like you're humming a song that, that we created together. Mm -hmm. So you have this memory. You, you, you're you humming a song because you enjoy, usually because you enjoy it and it's it's nestled in your mind somewhere. That's an excited face. Do you just sit on a pen? And also... You know, when you're really close to someone, you don't have to know the words. You don't have to say anything. Yeah. You can just hum along to the to the feeling of the relationship. Yeah, you share that. You can share that together. Yeah. There's also something that is amazing that I, I it blows my mind that I've never noticed this before. Walk on slowly. Don't look behind you. Don't say goodbye, love. I won't remind you. Walk on slowly. Don't look behind you. Don't 
You are familiar, no doubt, with the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Mm. Or Lot, yeah. In which Orpheus can lead Eurydice out of Hades, but only as long as she follows behind and he never looks back. Yeah. And lo- the looking back in that context in the myth is is doubt. It's like you can have the thing that you want, but if you doubt it for a second, which of course Hades has designed this whole trial to to fill him with doubt, Yeah. then you lose it. So it's it's sort of like this. It's like... Don't look for the moment when everything is going to fall apart. Otherwise, it's going to fall apart. Yeah. Just keep on humming and keep on going. Yeah, exactly. It's it's Schrodinger's tragedy. <laughs> it's Lot's wife. It's yeah. It's it's any number of things that that if is if you don't. It's Schrodinger's tears. Yeah, exactly. Are they there? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it also, and I apologize. I I never wax poetic about the fair anymore. I have very sour feelings about the fair, but this song... The Sterling Renaissance Festival. The Sterling Renaissance Festival in upstate New York, where you and I met. This song is final pub sing to me. Yes. this. So, in the course of my life, this song has reminded me of so many different things. Yeah. Depending on where I am in my life and what is in my rear view mirror. I have absolutely felt that this song has been about the the sadness at leaving the community at the Renaissance Festival, whether it's for a season or whether it's forever. And, you know, the not knowing whether it's going to be, this is the last time. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, mourning a relationship that never happened that I invented completely in my head. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Especially those. I've been there. Or mourning a real relationship. Sure. And, And then, you know, and I think what appeals to, what appealed to my young sense of romanticism was dream of me as the nights grow cold still marking time through winter dream of me as the nights draw cold still marking time through winter so marking time is when you march in place as a marching band oh okay you mark time with your feet by marching in place. Normally, you would keep the pace by stepping, obviously, but yes. but you're stopping for whatever reason. But you still, ha- everybody has to keep that that pace that that agreed upon, so that all the feet remain together. Yeah, gotcha. and you, and you okay. keep the beat. So that makes me think it's like it's almost like I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting here in this winter of the soul in which the relationship, whatever relationship it is, has stopped, and and I kind of can't move on. And you also can't move on because you're dreaming of me. But you paid the piper and called the tune and marched the band away. You paid the piper and called the tune and you marched the band away. As Katy Perry says, just because it's over doesn't mean it's really over. And if I think it over, maybe you'll be coming over tonight. Just because it's over doesn't mean it's really over. If you think about it, it'll happen. Thank you, Katy Perry. That's what we're talking about. Well, that song is actually about not being able to end a relationship as well. Oh, well, I mean, that kind of works here. Kind of fits a little bit. But yeah, it is. A little bit. Yeah. So much here. This, this song is really an interesting springboard for so many different things. It is. It really is. And it, it, it kind of, I think like you said, it, it, it's, it's a bit of a mosaic in the sense that oh, all these pieces will fit if you can make them fit. And if you look at it one way, you can kind of see something. If you look at it another way, you can kind of see something. But you you know it's a gorgeous piece of art. And it is, it's p- applicable to any number of things. And the last two lines of that dream of me, you just said, you, you said, you paid the piper and called the tune and you marched the band away. That's a bit, I'm not. I don't want to say blaming the the per, the you, the second person singular or plural, even. But it's at least saying, mm-hmm. it's at least acknowledging that they were responsible, at least in this instance. Yeah, I totally agree. It's putting responsibility onto the other party, or you know, maybe not all the responsibility, but a share of the responsibility. Right. That whatever whatever led up to this moment, you're the one who marched the band away. So. I want to interrogate one of the lines of the chorus. 
Uh, take a hand and take a bow. You played for me. That's all for now. Take a hand and take a bow. You played for me. That's all for now. Okay, I see two, at least, two possible interpretations of that line. Okay. The one that you posited, which is you have performed, literally or or non-literally, the role that was appropriate at the time. You have played for me. You've played the piano or you've played the role of my girlfriend or my husband. Right. And that's all for now. That part of the relationship is over. Okay. But played has another context in the English language. Go on. In a modern context, we say, oh, you played yourself. Oh, he played me. Oh. That usage of the word goes all the way back to Shakespeare and, and before. Okay. Hamlet asks... Guildenstern or Rosencrantz play upon this pipe and he says oh my lord I cannot and he says oh you cannot play this pipe but you have but you play upon me but what's the you played for me I think that it you know English is wonderful because you can move the words around and substitute them and it all kind of means the same <laughs> thing or whatever can't, you can't use that excuse <laughs> you can English is that's why English is so brilliant I think this could mean you made a play at me for instance, you played me for all I was worth. You know, one one way of looking at it is you fulfilled an important role in my life, and the other is you used me for what you wanted. You used me for an important role in your life. Yes. And and with the implication that maybe there was some bad faith there. And I think it works both ways, and it could even work both ways simultaneously. I mean, it, it probably does, but there there's such a sense of mourning in... The sound. Mm -hmm. Is it maybe tongue in cheek? That like, oh, I'm so sad because all you've done is used me. Go march away. Like, is that what you're getting at? I wonder if there's an uh, an implication or a, a tinge of that, or the the space is open for that to be the case. Yeah. And again, emotions aren't pure, right? Except, Except for my love of Katy Perry. God damn it. I was just going for something like that. Damn you. Uh, so you got to be quicker. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it could very well be, you know, 90% mourning and sadness and melancholy and 10%. I, I wonder if you actually, you know, God damn it. You kind of, you kind of screwed me over. Yeah. But also I miss you so much. And I, and I, you know, and I'm so happy that we had that time in our life and I wish it was still there. <sighs> Now, now you got me thinking. Oh no! Walk on slowly. Don't look behind you. That's like just don't let the door hit you keep, your ass yeah, on the way yeah, out. Yeah, keep walking. Don't say goodbye because it's not a goodbye. I won't remind you. Yeah, I mean, and even the word love. I mean, you know, oh, that, don't say goodbye, love. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's that's a loaded, a loaded hey, buddy, word. Yeah. Why didn't you keep on walking there? Hey, snuggle puss. I'm gonna cuddle hey. you so hard. <laughs> I think I found our, our outro bit. Hey, the love of my life. Why did you just walk out of there? I think that's entirely valid. And and I like it. I do. I, I do think it works. And I think that's really kind of probably one of the multifacet here. The way you can can look at it and get something out of out of all of it from any angle. I think genuinely, I do think really works for this song. It does still make me... Sad, you know, my, my romantic, it hits my romantic bone. If you play your cards right, you can, uh, <laughs> you can uh, hit my you, romantic bone yeah. too. But, but yeah, having that in the back of my mind, I'm not going to say ruins it. It taints it a little bit, but I think that's okay. I think that's more realistic now, you know? Tainted love, baby. Tainted, ooh, tainted love. So, small anecdote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I think of the title Slow Marching Band, I, I always think of this um, this group that I have seen a number of times in New Orleans. In New Orleans at Mardi Gras, there are the big parade floats that yep. everyone is you know familiar with the existence of. There are also what they call the, the walking crews, mm. which are groups of people who get together, dress up with a theme, and rather than having a big float that they ride on, they walk. Some of them pull a float behind them. You know, sometimes it's as small as a wagon. Sometimes it's more elaborate, but whatever. So there are these crews. One of them is named with with amazing boomer humor, 
The Half Fast Walking Club. Half fat. Oh, yeah, I get it. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, half, the Half Fast Walking Club. And there are a bunch of, you know, middle-aged guys and ladies who all dress up in some silly suits yeah. and they just walk down the street and throw out coins. How fast? Half fast. Half fast. Half fast. And every time I see them, I'm like, man, that is such a lame joke, but they are so committed to it. Yeah. They have coins with their with their logo emblazoned on it. They have huge flags that say, we're half fast, that it takes on a an element of absurdity that like, it's so unfunny that it makes it funny again. <laughs> There's a zeal there. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, <laughs> it always makes me laugh. It's like the red hat. The, the Red Hat Society or yeah. we took Rook to a kind of an indoor tr- trick-or-treating event this year. And there was this group of elderly ladies dressed in witch outfits that they and they like danced choreography. They just like, wow, stood in like a, a it had to have been over a dozen of them. So like a, a four by four square and they all did their dance and they did it to a, a bunch of different songs, but they, boy, were they, they were there, they were present, they were committed. And it's the same thing. Seeing like, seeing a retiree, you know, just really commit to something is like, you know, good for you. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nick, anything else to say about slow marching band? I don't think so. I do have a question for you though. Please. If this song... Oh, no, we haven't done this in a while. Very long time. If this song were a tea, what type of tea would it be? That one caught me off guard. I know. This would be the last tea bag oh. that someone who was very dear to you gave you a box of on a very important occasion, and it would have vanilla in it. Yeah. And maybe some kind of like a like a like a dried strawberry okay. flavor. It'd be a sweet sentimental tea. Sure. And you would have the impulse to crumple it up and just throw it away. But you would save it in the back of your cupboard and you would find it sometimes and just go like, oh Yeah, you forget that it's there and then you you never drink it. it. Yeah. So so the 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 parting of the ways here it, it was was not a happy, healthy, clean one. It's one that that everyone is having a difficult time moving past. Okay, okay. Regardless of how it went. Okay, so yeah, it could be enjoyed. In any other instance, it could be enjoyed and and really, really would be pleasant. But there's there's something there that that you 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 can't make yourself enjoy it. You can't make yourself drink it and not enjoy it. But you also can't get rid of it. That's right. It's like a tattoo with a girlfriend's name on it. Yeah. It's like a tattoo with the name of your favorite tea on it. I want to remind you. Remind you. Nick, what are we listening to next week? Next week, we are legit flipping the vinyl here. We are going to track number six. It's a big one. All told, but it is track one off of side B, off of the side known as Broadsword. It is the titular song, Broadsword. Oh, I can't wait. That's so fun. Here it comes. Until next week, take my hand and I will lead you to the Discord by way of our Patreon page. Patreon.com forward slash talk to me. Give yourself something to look forward to and order yourself some Talk Tall to Me merch, which will arrive on the Wells Fargo wagon. It's just a day away. It's coming around the bend someday. It'll be here any day now. See? Don't say goodbye, love. Say five stars, love. In the form of five stars and a review. We won't remind you. We won't remind you. Except every other time, every time that we do the Every week. Every week we will. Until next week, I am the cow coming home at the evening, Nick McGill. I am trouble with a capital T, (sighs) Omen Said. We are the tears dried upon your cheeks, the feckless moms. And this is the evil presence of a pool table in your community. Talk tell to me.
Well, Sal, I guess this is it, huh? You know, Benny, I, I really didn't want it to come to this point. But I think... I think it would be best for all of us involved. The guys and I have spoken. Wow. Okay. Benny, I, I think you're... A to Brute is what I'm going to say to that. I'll let Brute know that you, that you said that about him. Thanks. I appreciate that. You know what? You know what? You can't play a clarinet with a trumpet mouthpiece. That's, that's what I've come to learn. Whoa. Whoa. We're keeping this civil, all right? We have a long ride home. We're carpooling in my mom's minivan, and I really don't want to have to make you sit in the back. I've played the trombone for so many years for you. You know, I've seen people come up with with Jimmy the Trombone t-shirts, and I just think, you know, the, I, I can't wait to just slide right out of your life. I think it's funny that you're really excited about the Jimmy the Trombone t-shirts, because Jimmy the Trombonist was our last trombonist. You're, you're, you're Benny the trombonist. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's about the trombone. You you just try to find as good a trombonist as me. You find you find somebody who waits until they get off stage to release their spit valve. You know what, Benny? Don't say goodbye, love. I won't remind you. I would never. I would never say goodbye to you. I would never say goodbye to you. I'm never going to ever have a cup of coffee with milk and two sugars in it again. You know why? Why, Benny? Tell me. Because that's the way you like it. You you will deny me that? You will deny yourself that? To spite me? Yes. Yes, I will. You know what? Next time that you look over across the Hudson River, I dare you. I dare you, Sal. I dare you not to look up into the moon's shimmery light. And think about the good times that we had. I dare you not to do that. I dare you not to think about the time when we sat up on the edge of the pool by the the Hilton when we were touring in Kansas and talked about our feelings. I dare you not to think about it. You know what, Benny? The next time I share a single long strand of spaghetti and share a saucy smooch with some other trombonist, I'm not going to think of you. I'm going to move on. I'm going to get rid of the pillow. That's the same shape as your shoulders for when I sleep. Because you know I can't sleep with that. I'm never going to sleep again. It doesn't matter. I'm doing it to have you out of my life. That bottle of cologne that you gave me, I'm going to use it to spray my cats when they're bad. I'm not wearing that anymore. I'm never, ever, as long as I live, I don't care if the doctor tells me I would die if I have to do it. I'm never going to look at my left buttocks again. That's the one that fits perfectly in my right hand, Benny. That's the one where I have the shape of your right hand tattooed. <laughs> you, you know what, well, Benny? I, I, I think... I think we just need to make this a clean break. And I think that we need to come to, to grips. And I think that we need to acknowledge... As adults... As adult men in this room... Stop trying to grab my hand, Benny. Stop. I think we need to acknowledge... Stop. I... Don't brush the hair out of my eyes. You know what that does to me, Benny. Listen, listen. I've got... I have... I'm only gonna say this once, Sal. I'm only gonna say this once. Benny. You tell your sister that I appreciated all the time she braided my hair. You tell your mother that I would very much like her to send me her lasagna recipe. And you tell yourself... Every time you look in the mirror and you see all the places on your cheek where I gave you butterfly kisses, you tell yourself, Talk Tall to Me is a proud member of the Feckless Momes Audio Network. Oh, God. Benny. I can't believe I said it. I'm going. And I'm never coming back. I'm never coming back. I'm back. Just to see you one last time. Goodbye. Go, Benny, go.